So, how do we find, earlier on, Marion, we decided that rather than set ourselves a whole array of things to focus on, just for one year, we'd like to find one thing, ideally one measurable thing, that we could look to do. We had thought that, on the whole, trying to get politicians at this stage of European finances to come up with a huge bunch of new resources uh, is going to be pretty tough and may drive us into the sand, may not get us very far. We've recognised that uh, much of the things can be done within the, well, within the ambit of, of where we all work and where we all care, that is, changing the culture, changing the way physicians work and surgeons work, changing the way that psychologists work, getting people seen earlier, understanding that pain, chronic pain, needs to be treated earlier, needs to be subject to multidisciplinary approach, needs to have psychological approaches as well as drugs. We've agreed all of that. So the question is, what can we focus on now? Training was one thing, which is an obvious one, and of course, EFIC has already done about this, this survey, which has shown that only 18% of undergraduate medical students in Europe get any formal training on pain. That would be easy to, to measure. We could then do polls to see how many medical schools have put in place, as a result of the campaign, an improvement. The year after that, or the year after that, we could see if anything's actually happened. That's one possibility. What, what, what do you favour, if we're going to find one thing to focus on, above all? OK, since we put uh, forward that we would think in a term of uh, one year and not like EFIC on a long term, electing presidents uh, three years beforehand, um, then I would choose really something where we already have a benchmark. We have a benchmark. We invested already in creating these numbers and we know that uh, um, there is a huge deficit in the undergraduate training on uh, pain medicine and, and the management of pain. So this would be a very realistic goal to have a call on a European level to improve and um, to, to um, encourage, and maybe even more than just encourage, uh, within the, the possible system of, of the European uh, Commission and the European Parliament, to enforce maybe that this should improve and uh, something where many countries are very sensible for, I noticed in other projects, is to be on a ranking list. Maybe we can produce a ranking list which countries are doing the best and making this public also to the patients. And which countries, which countries are doing the worst as well? Oh, I'm, I'm living in, uh, also in one of the countries where we are not the best. Um, and one of these things, one of the reasons um, is also that if we want to encourage training, and I'm not, not just uh, aiming at training of, of physicians, of uh, surgeons and so on, this should be really also in a broad perspective towards nursing, physiotherapy, psychotherapy, but also awareness of patients. So please call education a little bit more larger than just medical education. Um, then it's clear that in the discussions, for instance, in um, universities in faculties of medicine, as long as you do not, uh, as long as you are not recognized as an expert in your field, you're sitting on a desk with surgeons, with uh, cardiologists, who are clearly, they are medical specialists and they divide all these uh, hours and uh, the goals of the medical training. So even in my university, it's unbelievable difficult to get through with this because they said, okay, you're not a medical specialist. It's first up to all the other medical specialists to divide these hours. So um, my call would be, this would be very feasible to go for the undergraduate training and put forward this as one of the major actions. Although, to establish this and to enforce this, we will need also um, a postgraduate uh, training, which is installed in some European countries. It's not general. We officially started it with the seven medical faculties in this little country, Belgium, but it has no value towards coding, for instance. Then we come back to this coding, which is uh, important. It has no consequences towards the time you can share with your patients. It, 
what if a patient, what uh, happens if we install, for instance, a law where every patient should have access to pain management in six weeks? If we do not have the people, if we do not have the structures, if we do not get a structure where you will be allowed to talk more than four minutes with a patient. So, um, and it all comes back to training, training, training. So that's a, a very clear point. Okay, so you definitely go for training. N Neil, I'm very conscious that there are perhaps a dozen things, important priorities. One of the things that we're all clear about is that patients have got to be at the heart of this. Now, training does not, on the face of it, put patients at the heart of it. For a start, it's long term. Somebody starting undergraduate training now is going to be six weeks, uh, six weeks, uh, six years before he or she becomes a, a phys physician, much longer before he or she becomes a qualified surgeon, much longer if they're going to need postgraduate education as well. This is long term. So would this suit you? Is, is this what we should focus on over the next year? Have you got a better idea? Um, I think I've got a slightly broader idea that encompasses that. Uh, one of the, I, I was formerly a chief executive of a patient group in the UK, Arthritis Care. One of the things I learned most perhaps painfully at times there, is, um, is that form has to follow function. Now, I know that's almost a cliche, it gets said, but it's easy to lose focus on it. So I think where we are, listening to what everybody has, has said here today, it's really important for this community to work out the function side of that, what it wants to do, which is your question, really, Nick. Uh, but alongside that, are there existing structures that could deliver on that? And if not, what would that new structure look like? And I think it would, I think as Wordsworth would say, you'd murder to dissect if you attempted to separate those two things. For me, uh, on the function thing, uh, I passionately believe that it's about getting, uh, to quote Jamie earlier, consensus on what good looks like. Because I can, I can envisage me and other people in this room in that, uh, having those conversations with, with Mariam, with, with, with people from the Commission about what we want to see happen. And I think the important thing to do is develop consensus on what best practice looks like. We don't need a bells and whistles, multi-million euro stakeholder project. We can begin with the people in this room working together to get some consensus about best practice. In order to see that best practice supported and crucially implemented, what would the structure look like? Well, EFIC uh, and Grunenthal together are currently uh, SIP. SIP is, is more of a, a platform than an organization. Um, so I don't know. I mean, if I think about ULA, the organization I, I also work on, on their executive committee, I've seen that over 10 years grow from being a bit like EFIC now, largely comprising scientific societies, and now, 10 years down the line, it considers itself to be an umbrella body in rheumatology and musculoskeletal. It comprises not only the scientific societies, but patient groups and allied health professionals. It reaches out regularly to family doctors and paediatrics, and it relates to orthopedics. It can basically talk to policymakers with, and, and say, we are talking to you with one voice. And I don't quite see a structure of that unifying kind within the pain community. Mm. So for me, it's agreeing what best practice is, working out perhaps a, a structure, a multi-stakeholder structure that could then help deliver how that should... Then you could get the training right. Because at the moment, because you would want training to support practitioners to deliver what we all agree would be the best possible care. But we don't know what that best possible care yet looks like. We haven't, I'm, I'm, we haven't uh, I, This is a, a, a prejudice, and it's not for me to, to uh, put forward my own views, but I'm going to anyway. I'm worried about that because I don't have any doubt at all that you're completely right. That unless we've got a consensus about what best practice looks like, what on earth are we playing around at? But my worry is if that is our focus for the next year, it's an internal one. And it would be good to say we've got to do that anyway. We've got to create that consensus. But let's get something on the tracks down, down the line. I'm rather inclined to go with, 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 with Bart's thought. That's not to say yours mustn't happen at the same time. The, I think the important thing is uh, that all of the external as well as internal developments have this binary approach yeah. of the patient voice alongside the health professional voice. My own organisation, the Chronic Pain Coalition, is moving as of next week 
to a new structure. So instead of having a chair, which until now has been a pain medicine doctor, it will be co-chairs led by one patient representative and, and one mm. clinician. So if we can be developing conversations, as you quite rightly say, should be happening now anyway, let's not wait, um, that can present that united front so that Pain Alliance Europe and, and their members, many of whom are here today, can work alongside ethics members and others, then we, I think we can be doing both. We can be creating the appetite for change to happen whilst internally agreeing what that change should look like. Exactly. Does that make sense, Pam? Yes. Um, Neil, I completely agree with your... For me, what you're explaining would be a midterm. Because um, you give the example of ULAR, and there are other examples. For instance, in, in diabetes care, diabetes is, is such a classical example. But what is the main difference with our area where we're working in? If you're talking about diabetes, if you're talking about rheumatism, at least you've got a professional structure where to the outside world and within the um, healthcare systems, there are clearly, uh, there is a clear definition of professionals of medical specializations, of undergraduate training. And although we are a very strong uh, federation and we, we represent uh, more than 20,000 uh, healthcare workers, mainly in, in Europe, we do not have this backbone like ULAR, like Diabcare, and so on. So that's the reason, although I completely agree with your approach, that we risk to get once again in this vicious circle in, in some of these, these discussions. And involving um, uh, the patient organization is, is very important and we try to do our best to be present wherever uh, we are uh, invited and, and called, called in. But some of the worries is that without the same professional backbone, you have for other successful projects, um, we will stick around in, in a little circle. That's my, my concern, and this is one of, of my visions for, for the futures. Good to yeah. an economist view on this. What do you think we should do? Uh, well, um, to, to me, it's, very, it's, 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 it's quite simple. It's, of course, uh, awareness. That's what's being done today as we speak. This is very impressive here, still. Um, it's education, as you put it forth. Uh, this is a process, we can start with it. It's exchange, which leads to best practice. And there's one big thing uh, in, in, in the off, so to speak. And this is make way not to fragmentalize the discussion. We cannot just concentrate on this here and see more and more um, healthcare systems falling apart mm -hmm. as we speak, mm -hmm. due to the UDO and debt crisis. So what's happening in many systems, even those of a weaker nature, that cannot be compared, let alone ranked, uh, by comparison probably to my country. We spent two billions in 2009, two billion euros on opioids. Uh, uh, ask a small country to do this per capita, and they can't, and they won't be able to. They're bleeding out, their personnel is laid, laid off or are, are looking for employment abroad. So the thing is you have to raise awareness for the, for the uh, uh, importance of having access to care financed by a so so social system of caregiving. Because without money, there is no treatment. And this is now shattered. It's shattered and endangered in many countries of our EU fraternity, so to speak, about, um, mostly in those depending on tax revenue, where there is no revenue, there is no employment, there is no training, and there will be no education, and there will be... Uh, even longer waiting lists. So raise awareness that with all this austerity thing and this growth, we have an eye for the social security element of access of care. Otherwise, it comes down to private payment, then you can have everything if you drive up in a Bentley. Marion, we are trying to find one thing that can make a difference, not to the exclusion of other things, but one thing that we can measure one thing we can when we meet again in a year's time we can say you know we did that we got somewhere because otherwise it's just talking 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 is that realistic in your view and and should we look to the european parliament to do anything other than just help us from the sidelines 
Well, first of all, I'm delighted to be here. Apologies, I couldn't make it any sooner. And of course, I'm even slightly late for this part of it. Uh, unfortunately, it's one of those days. However, to try to answer your question, and I listened carefully to what my colleagues said, because I haven't heard the deliberations sure. before this. And I'm trying to integrate to some extent what, what you have said in, into my response. I, I'd start with my colleague here. You talked about the economics of it. And you specifically said that because of the cuts in member states, etc., that um, healthcare systems are not quite falling apart, but in some member states they are, in others they are stretched beyond belief. And one thing came straight to my mind. We have something called the European Semester, where the European Commission looks at the budgets of member states and assesses those budgets and spending targets, etc. And one of the areas they are now going to look at is healthcare, because the Parliament, for example, along with others, but the Parliament in particular, pushed very hard that it wouldn't be just economic indicators. So, to be fair to the European Commission, that there would be social indicators. So maybe there's a possibility there of, of finding something in that. I mean, I'm trying to be practical here to talk about what can be done now or in the near future. That's not going to get more money into the pot. There is only so much money to go around. But it might help ensure that that sector gets a little bit larger slice of the cake. Um, I just want to also say, as I'm sure many of you are aware, that Ireland has now recognised chronic pain as a medical speciality in its own right. And before I came here today, I spoke to a, a man called Dr. Liam Conroy. Some of you may know him. He spoke at the last event here because I've kept in contact with Liam since then and I asked him about the impact of that because he's the specialist, he knows. And he talked about what you spoke of, about training and how important that will be. He also spoke about, um, and this comes back to the economics, about cost-benefit because they are putting in place um, care management uh, systems whereby after surgery, uh, concentrating on chronic pain as well as other areas, uh, patients can leave hospitals sooner, they can get home sooner if they have special packages put in place. So the economics of treating pain are, are also very obvious. Finally, and um, within the parliament, uh, we have, uh, if Audrey is here, Audrey Craven, I can't see her, but if she is, uh, Audrey and others have been hugely supportive in trying to set up a brain, mind, pain interest group in the Parliament, and that is going to happen after Christmas. And I think by coordinating that particular interest group with other intergroups in the Parliament, like the Disability Intergroup, which I'm vice president of, the Mental Health Interest Group, which I'm also involved in, and you mentioned diabetes, I'm also involved in, in a group on that, to, to look at the cross-cutting issue of pain, to raise awareness, to reduce stigmatization, which is a major issue for many people. That's not going to solve your problems today or tomorrow, but it does raise awareness and it will help members of parliament to, in specific areas, to look to see where they can try and affect change because now they are aware of certain things they weren't aware of before. Thank you. So, in a way, this is very much what Neil has been saying. Whatever else we do, Raising awareness has to be fundamental. And of course, there is this issue. It happens in every country in Europe. It'll have different names in each country. In England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland, we call it shroud waving. Uh, and that's where doctors will say, if you don't give me money in my department, then my patients will die. And that favours acute medicine all the time, of course. So it's very important that patient groups and those who support those patient groups for chronic conditions are able to make a noise as well to counteract the, uh, the, the pull of the acute services. Could I just open this up to the floor? We've got very limited time, and I'm really keen that we do get a consensus, if there is one. Um, can I, let's just try a show of hands. We have agreed we've got to get a consensus. Of course that's clear. We've agreed that we've got to make as much noise as we can. That's also clear. 
Who agrees with Bart that the, the one thing that perhaps we can measure over the next year and perhaps have a target up to the next three years when he takes, assumes the presidency of EFIC is improving rapidly and massively formal undergraduate education in pain management. Can I see a show of hands who thinks that that should be our primary issue over the year ahead? Quite a lot. And those who disagree with that? That seems pretty overwhelming, unless anybody's got another idea which you'd like to put up and see if that can overwhelm it. Yes, John, please. Uh, let me, I think we've got a microphone here. If I get that one to you. Uh, don't you? Don't you think you can also uh, look at education of patients because um, the MEP, uh, ME, uh, sorry, the uh, European uh, MPs could actually organise um, pamphlets and leaflets and stuff like that, which actually might be uh, acceptable to, to Marion and people if they're going forward. Because we are leaving out patients and that, that worries me. That's a very good, good e a point, that education is not just for doctors. Uh, and this issue of stigma, which has been raised particularly uh, by Irish delegates here is a very, very important one. We may not know just how much pain is being experienced on a chronic basis and perhaps on quite a severe basis by people who are being very stoical, who, who think, th feel it's shameful to come forward. Yes, please. Just on that, I would like to put into the pod the possibility of having health promotion activities like it has been done with uh, breastfeeding and that on pain issues uh, with the message of you don't have to put up with pain, there is something you can do. That's a really interesting one. People living with chronic pain um, are probably spend less than 1% of their time in a year actually in a clinic. So they spend 99 plus percent of their time at home, at work, living, just living with the condition. Which is why most people with a chronic condition don't like the word patient very much. They prefer to be called a person, a person with a condition. So actually, I just wanted to sort of recontextualise the vote a little bit, if I may, because I think this is largely, um, this is ethics meeting, in, in, in a sense, with many others invited. But I think it's fair to say we have a majority of clinicians or health professionals in the room. There are some patient representatives, but if the patient representatives were in the majority, we might have had a different answer. Well, uh, Neil, so, I want to know what that different answer would well, be. For example, uh, because people are living with their condition 99% of the time at home, then awareness campaigns and things which promote patient education and self-management are the things which largely matter a great deal. People like Pete Moore, who's been at this meeting, is a great champion of self-management. All of the Pain Alliance Europe member groups uh, are always promoting supported self-management. And as somebody said earlier, it doesn't mean just going home and not being a cost to the system. Uh, it's an investment, but it's a good value investment in helping people to decelerate their deterioration and, more positively, to stay independent, to stay in work, to have a family life. So I just wanted to mention that, because I think largely today we've concentrated, on, for good reasons, on, on sort of um, clinical issues, on clinical settings, on pain medication and on training. And I just wanted to sort of fly the flag for the patient agenda a little bit. And I think self-management deserves uh, a, a good recognition in this conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Gunter, uh, sorry, did you want to come in? Uh, yes, can we get a microphone down here to, to Ms. Gabazon, please? It, it's on, it's on, okay. I think so. Stop so? talking. Yeah. Bueno, yo... Well, I'm listening to you, and I see that there is a main uh, difficulty. Obviously, the professional training is important, the education of patients is important, but frustration arises because uh, the providers uh, of that service are uh, the health systems of our country. We have uh, to see how you are confronted to the final phase in a region like Andalusia with four million inhabitants, and I've explained that. Maybe the easiness, and I'm listening to you, and we all not only have the unity for the end of uh, the disease, but we have, uh, um, since a decade, um, 
pain units, pain wards. And uh, obviously, we have uh, economic problems. We have a very high rate of unemployment, especially in Andalusia. But uh, well, it was easy to guarantee this right. Uh, and we had the guarantee of a public health uh, service. But uh, let's say an integrated uh, health system from the primary care to the secondary care. The uh, pain treatment requires a multimodal uh, approach. A physician cannot act individually. We need uh, uh, several disciplines, but the reality is that in Europe, uh, our health systems are very different one to another, and they're very different. Uh, in the majority has got a public system, but it, it's th there are many differences in primary care or the uh, first entrance uh, where you need to treat this patient, and we need to treat this patient uh, at home because it's cheaper and it's better for the patient. So it's a problem of concern of the health system. We have designed these systems to deal with diseases in an acute way, and we haven't dealt with the population of chronic diseases where we need to deal with the pain, with the symptoms. So we need to be able to analyze the different health systems and to reach an agreement. We need to see which convergence is needed, where we need to get in order to guarantee this uh, uh, right to access. Because our systems that are public 100 percent, we can implement all that. In other systems, uh, they have private parts, and we won't be able to give equality. And I think that it's one of the main services uh, and one of the first services of our health systems. So not only training is important, but we need to see what convergence we need, maybe through the social indicators uh, um, from the European Parliament, so you can oblige uh, the, the uh, member states to modify their health systems. But the conception of the uh, health system is important. Okay. Uh, as you know, may, maybe one of the main problems is that all the debate on chronic pain is outside the official building, is at least at the European level, is not included, for example, in the agenda of the European Parliament working in the Health Commission, is not included, first, for example, in the agenda of the head of uh, the um, European Commission in the DG Health uh, leading with the chronic disease. Why don't put this topic in, in, the, in this agenda? Or why don't talk about the chronic pain also in the agenda of the Health Policy Forum, another European platform uh, led by DG Health, in which also my organization is one of the members. So this is a very concrete message. Our, also our commitment in, all, in order to realize this, uh, uh, this goal. Another one example. Until now, we are not sure that all the debate on chronic pain, it will be included in the final conclusion of the Italian presidency. Yeah. So we have at least one week in order to send an official message to Italian presidency to don't forget this topic in the final conclusion. And at the same time, I think it should be very important taking taking account of what was debated in September, that the European Commission can uh, create and support a network including all the operators on chronic pain. I say um, professionals, of course, but patients, civic organizations, the ministries, the, the companies, and so on. I think these are five concrete examples. Thank you, and thank you for raising the very important point that the Italian presidency has taken us so far, but so far it has not been written down and enshrined in anything, and that's coming up in the next few weeks, and we must make sure that gets onto paper and becomes formal policy. I'm uh, from Spain, representing one of uh, chronic pain uh, patient associations. We are all talking about uh, professionals and so on, but I think we are forgetting about the importance of the patient associations, 
with uh, for people with chronic pain in the daily life we can uh, help a lot for the people uh, in order to not get uh, worse or to get better uh, with the patient association but we are all normally sick and volunteers so maybe the doctors or the politicians could uh, help uh, uh, encouraging people to go to the associations or uh, helping us a bit as yep. uh, organizations. That's all. Thank you. Bart, what are you going to take a away from this? We've heard a, a, a variety of issues, all of which really are unarguable. It is unarguable that patients have got to be at the heart of this. It's unarguable that patient self-management is the ideal. It's unarguable that patient organisations need as much help as they can. It's unarguable that we need more resources if we can find it. It's unarguable that we need to get Europe as much as we can to have a common framework about it so that the, those with the best can pull up the rest. Uh, one idea which you mentioned, uh, another one, is that maybe we should have a name and shame. That's always very powerful for those countries, those institutions, which are not doing the things which palpably they should be doing. We've got the idea of, of uh, medical training as one thing that we could particularly focus on. We could do all of these things. Um, the trouble is, if we do them all at the same pace, uh, with the same uh, 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 amount of energy, we may not get very far with any of them. I, I don't know, what, what, what do you take away from this? I, what I take away from, from all the, the panel discussions is that um, I didn't hear any proposals where I could not, uh, which I could not support. So in general, there are many good ideas, there are many policies, there are many strategies, and uh, sometimes from other perspectives, other views, um, and that indeed, if we want to, to raise them, them all, the, the healthcare system is important, uh, resources are important, indeed, indeed. Um, we still have to come back to our first session. Chronic pain affects only one in five European adults. And so, whatever we choose, the impact should be uh, as broad as possible, and um, indeed, I was not focusing on hospitals. I work in a hospital, but the, the network and the home care is much more important. And if there are initiatives like, for instance, uh, self-management by internet, which is, is explored scientifically the, over the last years, and it, it seems to work, but still, I always come back to my point. What use? What is the use or the the, the role of internet supported or patient organization supported uh, self-management strategies, uh, self-help books, uh, other types of management, when uh, the primary, the, the caregivers, the GPs, the, the network nurses, the, the regional healthcare administrators are not aware and trained in the issue. What is the use if you come to your GP and he's not aware that there is something like internet-based uh, um, self-managing strategies, self-help books? If he's not aware that from a certain moment a psychologist maybe should be involved. So if we have to choose for a, a realistic, reachable goal in 12 months, I completely agree with all the arguments I, I heard, but if I've got to put money a little money on one project, I would say the half of the work has been done already. We have a benchmark, uh, we have an, a base, and we, we, if something can be moved during the next year, putting it on the agenda and uh, focusing and uh, stressing, and you uh, called it a name or shame, yes indeed, maybe if, we sh if, if that's the only way we should do it. I think it's almost impossible to draw the threads together in this because there have been so many of them. But I think what impressed me most was when I started this, I assumed that this was largely a matter of channeling more resources in. And I was very depressed because that is extremely hard to do in this climate. But what we've heard is much more optimistic. Yes, of course we need far more resources. How on earth are we going to see patients very quickly? How are we going to get all these multidisciplinary teams? How are we going to get all this training without more resources? That's pretty fundamental. 
But I think there's been a very mature recognition that a lot of the answers lie within our own hands as patients, as physicians, as campaigning organizations. We can get cultural change. And that's not just a cost issue. We can get better training. Mertz and Daz was, was, was telling us how in, in Dorset, once they'd got in a small amount of money, to, to help them kick-start the project, it became self-financing. And one of the points that the health economists like Gunter have been pointing out is this is a, an obvious sell, because with so much money being lost in, in work, in gross domestic product and all the rest of it, this is a, 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 an obvious win-win uh, situation if we get it right. Um, it's been a decade, I think, something like that, since the Council of Europe recommended each individual has the right to avoid unnecessary suffering and pain. I mean, up to now, it's been a long road with very little palpable progress, except as we've heard in Andalusia and in Italy. And we've really got to make sure that now we do what we can with the opportunities that we've been given. I think we all accept that the door is now ajar. It's open for the, perhaps the first time in a very long time. Um, just some quick thank yous. Um, thank you, of course, to, to EFIC and those who've organised this. A lot of people have been involved in it, and to our co-sponsors, Gunnantal, who've put a lot in. Those of you here last night heard a word of particular thanks to somebody from Gunnantal, uh, Conrad Lavashan. Uh, he has not just helped, well, organise this, basically, uh, of course, with the team, but he's done a huge amount of, of work in collating for us on the panels a huge amount of academic background material. Um, it's been an extraordinary uh, amount of, of effort on his part. And the ultimate sacrifice was so many people who were attracted here that he had to give up his own room in the hotel and, and, and move out. So, Conrad, thank you very much in, indeed. Well, thank you very much. And I suppose the first thing I would say is it's, it's always difficult to close a conference if you haven't been here. So in that context, I will make it very brief. You'll be pleased to hear. Um, but this is my third time to be involved with this conference and with various stakeholder groups over many years on this issue. So it is an issue that is, is close to my heart. But I'm just going to say a few brief points and just taking from some of the discussion that, that I've heard for the last few minutes. And I'm one of these people that I, I try to see, no more than our presenter here today, what can be done? What, what can we do now or what can we do in the short term? But on one issue, I might have a slight difference with you. I wouldn't just look for one thing from this conference. What I would suggest is that different actors do one thing, because there's a lot of different actors here. There's politicians here, there's patients groups here, there's medical people here, there are NGOs here, so that if, if each of those groups were to take on one or two uh, issues that they wanted to progress in the next 12 months or whatever, and in some way to try to coordinate them, to, to you know, this great word synergy, to create some synergy, and that's what I'm thinking about in the parliament, that maybe the, the impact could be a little bit greater. But I, I too just want to thank um, the European Fain, Pain Federation for organizing this conference and Grunenthal also, and for all of you who have attended it. And as I said, I'm very pleased to be here today. And while I haven't been at the conference, all I can tell you is that within uh, four to five weeks at the most, Audrey Craven will have told me everything that has happened here today. I will not be ignorant as to the uh, outcomes from today. As I said earlier, I'm very pleased that Ireland has recognized chronic pain as a speciality in its own right. That, of course, is an act, and we've got to wait to see what follows. But it does have implications for training. But I hear what you say, that that's a long-term issue. But surely that might be able to kickstart in-service training, you know, for people who are already in the system. And I know from speaking to Dr. Liam Conroy today, he spoke about the possibility of that happening in Ireland, maybe for other member states, that people might be able to come there and avail of training. And as I said, he also spoke about, spoke about the cost-benefit analysis, and we, we've mentioned that already. I won't go back to it. He did also say that this will have an impact uh, when patients are dealing with 
insurance companies and also when they're dealing with the health authority in Ireland. It, it strengthens their rights, as it were, or their hand when, when dealing with the, the, those various agencies. But unfortunately, uh, and it was a point touched on earlier, with the cuts to the health services, and Ireland, unfortunately, uh, is, is suffering considerably in that area. Um, it, it's having really awful consequences. And Dr. Conroy told me today something that I did not want to hear. He told me that of the last five uh, persons he has trained in pain management, the last five, four of them have gone to Australia and one of them to Canada. There's nobody left in Ireland or in Europe. And there are many reasons for that, and one of them certainly has to do with the, the, the cuts to the system. And that's a heartbreaking thing to hear, because you realize that the good work that individuals are doing you know, is, is just not, uh, if you like, th there aren't results coming from it. But today is about what can we do, and today is about looking to the future. And I can only concentrate on what I can do within the Parliament, and I hear some very clear messages, and not just within the Parliament, within the institutions. Number one, we have to try to encourage the Italian presidency to make sure that in their council conclusions or whatever documents they have at the end of their presidency, that pain is, is part of their council conclusions. And as soon as I go back to my office, or certainly this afternoon, I'll start to make inquiries as to who, at least I as an individual MEP, uh, involved in the Brain, Mind, Pain uh, interest group in the parliament, could write to, to see that this remains on the agenda. I'm not saying that will have an impact, but it is something that I can do, and, and I will talk to one or two people about it. You also spoke about it being on the Commission's agenda, or that it isn't on the Commission's agenda. Again, MEPs can help with that. If you get MEPs, and there are a number who are sympathetic to this issue, uh, particularly if they're on the relevant committees, I'm not, as it happens, but uh, if they are, they will know the Commissioner personally, and they will be able, through the Commission, uh, officials, who are just as important as any commissioner, uh, to, to try and get this issue onto the agenda. And you can actively work with MEPs to, to try to make that happen. I mentioned the other interest groups in the parliament, um, and there are, there are more, that we can maybe try to find to look at pain as a cross-cutting issue, so that when we're speaking, whether it be about diabetes or about mental health, that we relate it in some way to pain as well. It doesn't become the whole of the picture, but it is a part of it. Because obviously that, that's, that's very, um, I think that's a useful way to go about it. And um, you mentioned that the Irish contingent in particular were anxious about stigma. And I'm aware of that having read your documentation, etc. And again, maybe that is something we could put our minds to and I'm not saying this is a solution, but I've seen recently in Ireland, in the last 12 months, we've put huge emphasis on mental illness and mental health. And one of the ways we have brought the discussion into the open is by having celebrities, sports stars, people who are known through the, the TV, through social media, whatever, getting in on the conversation and saying, this is part of my life. And it's extraordinary the way people have begun to listen and how I think it has begun, at least, to help destigmatize the issue of mental illness. Over the last 12 months, I have heard testimonies from people and you would just, you would just stand to listen to them. And people listen because it, they're not politicians, they're not doctors, they're not patient organizations. They're people who are known for other reasons. And, and I think that has been very powerful and maybe something that, that you know, could be looked at as a possible way to eliminate stigma. Two final points. Oh, yeah, one other point. You mentioned about harmonizing, and, and I agree entirely with the chairman. It, apart from anything else, sometimes you have to be careful what you wish for. Because once you harmonize at European level, you can end up with a lowest common denominator. Now, if, you know, and, and equally, I think in the current climate, um, it, it is not a way to go, and, and that's my honest opinion. I wish it were different. I genuinely do. 
but I don't think there will be any real progress. Frameworks, yes. Codes of conduct, yes. Whatever you can find. But beyond that, I think it, it's not going to be possible right now, at least in my opinion. Two final points. You mentioned that um, the patient organisations uh, need to be heard because 99% of the time, somebody who suffers from chronic pain has to manage that at home. And, and I think that voice needs to be heard and needs very much to be part of the debate because people have to go home, they have to close the front door of their home and then they have to learn to live with it. And yes, medical, uh, whether it's a doctor or a nurse or whatever, and, and medicine, etc. They all play a role, but, but people have to learn to live with it. And I think that from the practical day to day, that the support of these organizations, their promotion, their inclusion in the debate, you know, I think is, is really, really important and will make a difference um, to, to the lives of ordinary people. And I suppose the final point, and, and many people have alluded to it here, is about training and I don't think I need to add to it. Most of you here know a great deal more about that than I do, but I recognize the importance of training so that for the person who's behind the front door of their own home, that if they lift the telephone to their GP or whoever, that that person knows what they're talking about and perhaps may be able to help them. So in that, I'm going to, to close this conference. As I said, um, apologies for not being here. It just wasn't possible, but I can assure you I will, I will know what happened, and I will work with, with Audrey and others uh, you know, to, to try to, within 12 months, whenever your next symposium is, to be able to come back here and say, at least at European Parliament level, these are the actions that we took and these are some of the outcomes. And I think if, if all of the actors here today, you know, try to do that in 12 months time or whenever we get together again, we may be able to see some progress. And I think if we can manage to do that, then I think this will have been a worthwhile conference. Thank you very much.